Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a young and well-accomplished professional and entrepreneur from India, Mr. Shiv Parik. Shiv, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, Ashutosh. Thanks a lot. Great to be on this show. Thank you. Shiv is the founder and chief executive officer of HBITS. Uh, he has worked earlier with City and the Stanford Management Company, and he's been recognized by both Forbes and Business World uh, amongst the 30 and under 30. So Shiv, before we talk about HBITS, tell me about your journey in brief and how has your background in engineering and your business school from Harvard influenced your approach to real estate? Yeah, I think uh, so. Um, I studied engineering physics at Stanford, which was, uh, you know, an amazing course. And just mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about why I took that course, it was pure passion and pure interest. I was right. always mathematically uh, inclined. So wanted to do something uh, in that vein. And uh, I thought, why not learn more about physics? You know, theoretical physics was something that I was extremely interested in and with an engineering uh, uh, flavor as well. I think how that has, and the idea was never from a perspective of what will I do next in my career. It was just pure interest. But I think right. the the ability to think analytically uh, using logic, um, I think that is applicable and transferable anyway. Mm -hmm. Any problem solving, any, any business problem, whether it's real estate, which I'm into right now. Uh, but to be honest, I think it would be transferable into any business in any industry. Absolutely. Um, my experience at Harvard was completely different. Uh, it's an it was an MBA course, um, and that's obviously much more broader, much more holistic, and much more tied into uh, you know day to day business. Although I will say though, uh, entrepreneurship is is very different to what you learn in the classroom. Right. Uh, although the beauty of Harvard is that you learn from your classmates, not just your professor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the case method where probably for 80% of the time, it's more the other students who've come from varied backgrounds, whether it's, uh, you know, varied backgrounds in terms of age, experience, geography, uh, who are talking, uh, then um, uh, then you're learning from the professor itself. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of a little bit about my two experiences. Well said, well said. So let's talk about HBITS. Tell me a little bit about HBITS. What do you do? And how do you differentiate yourself from other real estate investment platforms? So yeah, see at HBITS, we're looking to democratize access to real estate. Um, so with a much smaller, and, and the idea was the same way one can own a share in say a Tata or a Reliance stock. Why can't one own a share in a property and really to create the stock market for real estate? Uh, that's kind of the vision and the mission. And in fact, recently, uh, SEBI has started regulating the space as an SM REIT or a small and medium REIT as they call it. Mm. notified on March 8th. Um, so that's kind of the vision to get access to real estate at a much smaller ticket size because otherwise on a full full building, you know, pay hundreds or thousands of crores or even right. a floor of a building in the tens of crores. Right. Uh, but with the new regulation, you can own this asset class as an investment at say starting at 10 lakh. And this is a very attractive asset class to own because one mm. gets 8 to 9% rental yield that's backed by long-term contracts with mm. MNC kind of tenants. And along with appreciation, you can make a 15 odd percent IRR with minimum downside risk. Right. To answer your other question, how are we different to other investment platforms? Um, so firstly, in this model, there are only a couple of other sizable players in the market. So they're not too many mm. uh, because there are high barriers to entry to get in, uh, in terms of the kind of skill sets that you have. Um, and then I think we'd like to pride ourselves on our real estate capability and ability given that I come from a real estate background and I can talk about that, mm. we are extremely particular in terms of, you know, our sourcing assets, our diligence of assets, our ability to lease assets and our ability to exit assets to give the best returns to our investors. Interesting. And you just mentioned you come from a real estate background. Yes. Tell me a little more about that. So my father has been into commercial real estate development uh, for the last 30, 35 years. Okay. Uh, so he's kind of developed buildings, leased it out to these tenants. Mm. Uh, and obviously I've worked a little bit with him. So I have some flair and some understanding uh, of that market and ecosystem. So Shiv, the question that I often have when it comes to fractional ownership of real estate 
is that who is the market maker and how does if uh, how does a small investor say of 10 lakh rupees who invests with you what is the process for him or her to make the investment and how do they exit yes so i can talk a little bit about the process today and the process once the sebi regulation uh, we right. apply and list the first property so as of today every asset is in a separate private limited entity and investors get shares and ccds convers compulsory convertible debentures in that private limited company as per the amount they've invested uh, and then monthly basis rent flows into the private limited company and is paid into the investors bank account similarly with with sebi um, it's going to be a listed trust. Investors will get units in the trust mm -hmm. and different units will represent different schemes or different properties again. So the, the real beauty is that people can still pick and choose which asset they're investing in. So that's kind of the broad structure mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre-SEBI and post-SEBI. And post-SEBI, the way it works, it's, it's effectively like an IPO process, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a book building IPO process for investors to subscribe to the properties. Mm -hmm. How do investors exit? Uh, there are two ways. One is investors can shell their, sell their shares or now their units with SEBI, which will be listed at any point in time that they want. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we have a universe of almost a lakh users on our platform, which they can trade into. Mm -hmm. Or in four to five to seven years, we look to exit the full property and give the appreciated returns to the investors. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So my next question, Shiv, is what are some of the key factors you consider when selecting a grade A commercial property for investment? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the most important question, I'll say, uh, for our investors. And we pay a lot of attention to that. So some of the factors, and obviously it's not exhaustive, but some of the factors are building quality. Uh, that's extremely important. Mm. Uh, building location. Uh, and there are two parts of location. One is in which neighborhood or micro market the building is in. And then number two is in that micro market, how is the building located? Uh, then there's the tenant quality, uh, right? So good credit worthiness of the tenant. Um, there's the leave and license agreement or lease agreement between the tenant and the property owner. Uh, and that has to be extremely secure and uh, safe. Um, and then we look at the rental uh, and make sure the rental is below the market average. We look at the capital value and try and make sure that's below the cap capital, uh, below the market capital value. Mm -hmm. So broadly, uh, obviously there's more nuances, but these are some of the very important parameters mm -hmm. that we look to check before bringing it onto our platform. Very interesting. Thank you. And Shiv, how do you ensure transparency and trust for investors part participating in fractional ownership? Yeah, I think that's extremely important. We try and offer that at each and every stage of investment, right? Mm -hmm. For instance, pre-investment, uh, every kind of detail that we have of the property mm -hmm. uh, is presented to the investor, right? So uh, how we analyze the building quality, what we think of the tenant profile, uh, in the leave and license agreement, what are the major clauses? And in fact, the leave and license agreement itself is available on the dashboard for investors to see. Mm -hmm. uh, the title report is available on the platform for investors to see. Their photos, video walkthroughs of the property. So, any detail that an that an investment committee of say a Blackstone would need, that kind of detail is provided to the investor, mm. uh, the retail investor. Mm. Post transaction, there are regular updates on an investor's dashboard as to the ongoings of the property. We provide annual valuation reports. Uh, again, so there's constant feedback, constant transparency with the investor. So through that transparency and through data that we have. Uh, so, for instance, we look at each and every sale and even license transaction in that market mm. uh, and provide that to the investor to, to allow mm. benchmarking, to show them the benchmarking as to what price we've picked up the asset at. Mm. Uh, so that's how we kind of show the, the transparency to the investor. Well said. You know, you mentioned about the whole process of democratizing access to real estate. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of how the impact of HBITs has been able to democratize access to premium real estate assets or investments for uh, the small investor? No, so for instance, right? I mean, I can just look at any one of our assets, hmm. um, right? Say our asset in Andheri that's rented out to Akruti, uh, rented out to ICICI Bank. Now hmm. that asset was a 25 crore asset. Uh, so before this model, um, on one hand, the seller of the asset could only sell it to someone who had 25 crore, which would be an ultra H&I investor. Yeah. Uh, but now with this model, we have investors who put in 25 lakh, 50 lakh, 20 lakh uh, to own shares in this 
you know, office unit that's mm. rented out to ICICI Bank. Mm-hmm. And that's creating value on two sides. Mm. One is for the seller of the asset, uh, which is predominantly either developers or past investors. So for, for a developer, they are getting a very, you know, uh, good exit option for them to take their capital out and redeploy it and bringing liquidity into the real estate market. Mm. And number two, it's, it's for a very attractive asset class. Uh, it's giving investors access uh, at a much smaller ticket size. Mm-hmm. And now, like I said, with SEBI coming into uh, the picture uh, through the SM REIT regulation, they've reduced the ticket size to 10 lakh. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they've also suggested that as trust is built in this industry, uh, that 10 lakh can be reduced even further down. Wow. Okay. So my next question is that for any real estate uh, you know, portfolio that you're going to be renting out, there are two aspects of it. One is the rental yield that you're getting mm-hmm. and one is the capital appreciation. Absolutely. That you're getting. Absolutely. Now, while the rental yield is relatively stable, correct. So your example of the building that you gave, which has been given to a big bank, the exit uh, value of the asset yes. could fluctuate dramatically. Right. I mean, right now, the boom it's, it's booming and therefore there's an upside, but there could be a real estate crash as has happened in some countries around the world. How do you uh, help to mitigate risk for an investor on both these aspects? Yeah, so two aspects, right? Rental yield and uh, capital uh, appreciation. So I'll answer both those. First on the rental yield side, right? One, we ensure the tenant is credit worthy. You know, one tenant we have ICICI Bank, other tenant we have is Toyota. So those are the kind of tenants that we we have. Uh, generally MNCs or large listed Indian companies is what we look at. Mm. Uh, number two, we look at the lock-in uh, and the length of the leave-in license agreement with the tenant and the that property. Mm. Number three, we look at the rationale for the tenant being in that location. Is it the head office? Have they been there for 10 years, 15 years? Mm. Are they looking to relocate? Is that tenant expanding in India? Or is the, you know, a lot of these subjective related uh, questions for the tenant's occupancy in that uh, property. Mm. Number four, has a tenant done the CapEx to fit out the property? Mm. Uh, Because then they're even more invested in that property. Uh, And number five, the rental. Mm. Uh, If the rental is below the market, uh, then I know that even if the tenant leaves, I'll be able to release the property, right. property relatively easily. And mm-hmm. there's good no- notice, the notice period and the sure. security deposit as well. Sure. sure. That's ensuring the uh, uh, stickiness uh, of the rental. Uh, number two, coming to the capital value uh, and the appreciation. So, uh, you know, while in foreign markets, there has been fluctuation in real estate prices. In India, what we've seen though, historically, and I think that's because of the demography, because mm-hmm. of the economy, um, you know, uh, and more so in residential real estate, uh, there have been more fluctuations. But in, in commercial real estate, uh, because your end occupier is a renter, mm-hmm. uh, it really tracks inflation, um, you know, because it's much more systematic uh, industry, the office market than the mm-hmm residential market which does have boom and bust right uh, the other part is again we look at the capital value and ensure it's below the market average um and also there's no leverage or there's no debt on any of these properties mm. uh, so worst case scenario if the market is bad real estate is always cyclical yeah. you hold on to your asset for a year a year or so more uh, so the cycle changes and then you're able to exit at a good value Mm. Um, but ultimately, yes, the entry price point becomes extremely important. Mm. Uh, uh, the price at which you get in, which is why we're very selective on that price. Mm. Well said. Yes. There's also a question that I wanted to ask you on technology. And yeah. There's been a lot of discussion for several years on how blockchain could actually make a significant difference in the way properties are owned in our country. Right. Because of just, just the the transparency that a blockchain can provide. My question is, how do you see blockchain or other emerging technologies influencing fu- the future of fractional ownership? See, I think, so I, I'd say there are two larger buckets of technology. One is blockchain and the other is, say, machine learning and AI. Mm. Uh, I think blockchain does have, could play a significant role. Mm. Um, and the, the role would be, I think, in streamlining the 
title uh, of the property. And especially if you can fractionalize on the blockchain, the title, uh, then it would play a significant impact in the ease of transferability of the property right. uh, and the speed and the diligence that is not required if it's on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the blockchain part for that to be successful, there's government and regulatory support required. It, it cannot be done without the government uh, oversight and blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, because if it's, if someone, any platform just builds a tool on their own, um, and a transfer happens on it, uh, one, no one would want to make that transfer because if the government is not saying it's a valid transfer, uh, then it doesn't make sense. So you do need government or regulatory support for that to be successful in India or, or in any market for that matter. Right. Um, number two on the machine learning part, uh, you know, we're trying to create the stock market for real estate, right? So what, what do you need in a stock market or any market? You need information. Mm. What does machine learning provide you? One is, uh, in India, each and every sale and even license transaction is public information. You can download it from state government websites. Mm. Uh, so in fact, what we are working on right now is mapping out each and every transaction, uh, creating a map, you know, a live map of every transaction that's happened. So that's number one. Number two, uh, you also have access to supply because again, the approval stage of each and every product is public information through again, state government websites. Mm. If you can map historical demand and future supply, this information then gives you an insight into future demand and future pricing uh, of assets. So you're really able to predict in which way prices are going to move. Uh, and that allows one to make better investment decisions in the property. And it prevents, again, the cycles that are traditionally present in the real estate industry because of lack of information. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, creation of transparency, predictability uh, lends itself to much more investment into this uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Well said. You, uh, a few minutes back, were telling me about how SEBI has now, you know, decided to regulate this whole process. I wanted to ask you that, Given the forthcoming regulatory landscape that is coming up a fraction of the ownership, mm -hmm. how will an HBITS investor mm -hmm. benefit from this kind of regulation? What will it do for the investor? Yeah. I think number one, the investor will get the comfort that it's now regulated by SEBI. If anything goes wrong, which I, I don't think it will with us, but... Uh, they have SEBI there. Mm. Uh, number two, given that it's listed, uh, uh, we envision the liquidity increasing further, the transparency, the liquidity of the uh, the units that investors own. So the speed of exit will become much quicker. Mm. Uh, number three, uh, you know, the, the operational efficiency will increase. The shares will be in DMAT. Uh, it's an established framework. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, there's much more, it's much more systematic and transparent for the investor. Uh, there are certain disclosure norms that SEBI is prescribed, which anyways, we disclose anyways, but the investor will get the comfort that, okay, this is SEBI mandated. Uh, so, you know, I'm comfortable in this investment. So uh, I think these are a few of the things that will create much more investor trust uh, and allow the industry to scale as well. Well said, well said. So I have time for two more questions for you, uh, Shiv. My next question is, what are some of the environmental and sustainability considerations that you keep uh, in your uh, mind when you make an investment decision? Right. So we try and to be honest, uh, we look at assets and we endeavor to look at assets that are ESG compliant mm -hmm. uh, or they're gold uh, certified or gold lead certified or platinum lead certified. So these are a few of the norms that we look to fulfill. Mm -hmm. I think in this industry, in the commercial real estate industry though, uh, you know, a lot of the push is coming from the tenants themselves or the occupiers of the property themselves. Right. So really, if you have, say, an ICICI bank, a Toyota, uh, or like, you know, a tenant could be like a Deloitte or an Accenture occupying the property, uh, and they themselves, these large corporates, have their mandates to only acquire uh, environmentally uh, compliant buildings, uh, then to a degree, you're assured that in the assets that you pick up, because mm. these tenants have anyways done their due diligence, uh, you're able to pick up an environmentally um, uh, compliant building. Mm. Uh, and I think that's important from an investor perspective as well, because only if a building has environmental compliance, is it future proof mm. uh, in terms of an investment, right? right. Only uh, you see tenants will, because the, the compliance norms 
uh, uh, required from an environmental perspective is just going to uh, increase uh, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So the buildings need to be future proof or the assets need to be future proof for an investor to make his or her return. Mm -hmm. Well said. And my last question to you, uh, Shiv, what trends mm -hmm. are you seeing for the commercial real estate market in the next few years? Right. I think... Um, See, I, just overall commercial real estate in India has been driven by um, the outsourcing market, uh, right? It started in the late 90s, uh, you know, the Infosys, back office, call centers of the world. Uh, so number one, real estate in India has always been uh, uh, driven by global occupiers. I think what's changing is that India is not only now the back office of the world, Mm -hmm. It's also becoming the front office of the world. Okay. So higher and higher value add services are now moving to India mm -hmm. uh, because of our level of talent in the country that's increasing further and further. Right. Uh, so this whole GCC global capability center trend. Uh, so a lot of jobs are moving to India. And in fact, COVID in a sense helped the office market in India surprisingly and counterintuitively mm -hmm. because as you know, say an American corporation realized that its employees can work from home, mm -hmm. then why can't its employees just work from India? Right. Uh, right. So that, that trend is, has picked up. Uh, another thing driving the real estate market uh, or that has driven the real estate market in India, commercial real estate market in India in the last 10 years uh, has been the rupee depreciation. Uh, because dollar, say 10 years ago or so, was 40 rupees. Uh, now it's about 80 rupees. Mm -hmm. So for a, an American company, uh, the real estate, uh, while the rents have risen, the rupees also depreciated. Mm -hmm. So for them on a dollar per square foot basis, it stayed the same. Correct. Um, and while for other industries, maybe that doesn't help our economy, from a real estate perspective, the depreciation tends to help. Uh, you know, and as India, uh, that's, expected to continue. So these are a few of the trends I see going forward in the commercial real estate space. That's it. Shiv, on that note, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for speaking to me about your own journey. Thank you for speaking to me at such length about H bits, about fractional ownership, about how the, the, the small in, uh, investor can now actually be able to play a role uh, in the upside of commercial real estate, which hitherto was not really possible because of the ticket size being very, very large. Thank you also for talking to me about technology that is going to, that you're using and that likely to change as well as your own perspectives of uh, the whole concept of commercial real estate and fractional ownership. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashutosh. Great being here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.